Friends, may I declare the traditional session of the International Friendship Club open. Friday is the day of the English section, and judging by all this, they are going to have something very interesting today. I hope so. On the agenda, talk on Great Britain and admission of new members. We are lucky to have Ivan Petrovich Fyodorov as our speaker today. I believe everybody knows him. He has just returned from his tour of Great Britain. So he has a lot to tell and show us today. Please, Ivan Petrovich. Thank you. Well, to begin with, I suggest an informal talk. It'll be better for practice. So any questions or comments are invited. Let's view some slides first. I've got a question. May I? Uh, what's the difference between Great Britain and England? Let's begin with a the map then. You see, the British Isles consist of two large islands, Great Britain and Ireland, and about 5,000 smaller ones. Great Britain includes England, Scotland and Wales. Great Britain and Northern Ireland, or Ulster as it's known, form the United Kingdom. The greater part of England is lowlands. On the other hand, Scotland and Wales are mainly mountainous areas. And all this you could see during your trip? Not quite. I'll tell you the truth. Actually, our group travelled for about two weeks. But I'd spent about two months in the library. I did quite a lot of reading on the subject. Books about England, Ireland, Scotland. Books on history, geography, economics and politics. Did everything come in useful? Certainly. That's a helpful hint to all of you. Read as much as possible. It will come in useful sometime. And now about Great Britain. Please. We had our first glimpse of Britain at Heathrow Airport. Today, Heathrow is one of the largest airports in the world. It's served by nearly 70 airlines. Planes arrive and depart every two minutes. And airline buses run at frequent intervals. Is he through far from London? No. The journey from Heathrow to London takes about 30 minutes by bus. That is if you don't get caught in a traffic jam. London, the capital of one of the most highly industrialized capitalist countries of the world. The seat of the government. The home of millions of working people and an ancient city. The center of British cultural life, famous for its historical sites and tourist attractions. And what places did you visit? I'm coming to it. Besides London, we went to Preston, Liverpool, Sheffield, 
Coventry, Newcastle. We also went to Scotland. And what impressed you most? If you mean landscape, the answer is Scotland. But I'll show you Scotland later. Let's start with Preston. Are you ready? Preston is not a very large town, but it's developing fast today. In Preston, we visited the British Leyland Motors Works. 55,000 workers are employed here. They produce cars and buses and lorries. 95% of all the cars that run on the roads of Britain are made by British Leyland Motors. The firm exports into 100 countries. Especially popular are Leyland double-deckers. Now Preston is in Lancashire, which is a traditionally textile region. But today, it's a fast developing area for the aircraft and car industry. Now, it's also one of the chief areas for chemicals, electrical engineering and electronics. cities are there in Lancashire? Well, there's Liverpool in the first place. Liverpool, you know, is the largest city of the region. It's Britain's chief port of export, the greatest centre for processing imported foodstuffs and raw materials. After Liverpool, we travelled through the famous Black Country, the region for metallurgy and heavy industry, the old coal mining area. And then we went to Coventry. Coventry is also an important centre of the aircraft and car industry. In World War II, it was badly damaged by the fascist bombs. Now it's been completely reconstructed. The centre of the Midlands is Birmingham, an old manufacturing town. And after that, we visited Sheffield in Yorkshire. Which is famous for its steel. Absolutely right. In Sheffield, they produce all kinds of wares. Knives and forks, all kinds of machinery, even aircraft and missiles. But the traditional industry in Yorkshire is woolen textiles, including knitted goods. Agriculture in Great Britain is mainly where the lowlands are. Sheep are a part of an English landscape. The traditional British animal for breeding is sheep. But mind you, the main stock of wool comes from Australia and New Zealand. Dairy farming is widely practiced too. I understand the quality of the produce is high, isn't it? Yes, both in industry and agriculture, emphasis is laid on quality. As England can't compete in mass production, it's the only way for the country to survive. went to Newcastle, a large industrial centre in the north-east of England. It ranked second in the country after the Glasgow docks and shipbuilding yards. The working class of Great Britain. Workers like these can be seen in the east end of London in the factories of Manchester. Newcastle is one of Britain's main ports of import. Non-ferrous metals and oils are imported here. And still, what impressed you most? I may sound trivial, 
but I liked London most of all. So here is my home movie. We arrived in London on a Sunday morning. Ah, oh, the traditional London fog. I wouldn't call it traditional. True, the weather is changeable in England, but it doesn't always rain, as some of us may think. The rainy and foggy season is late autumn and winter. A boat trip on the River Thames is a favourite of all visitors to London. The Discovery, Captain Scott's polar research ship. He sailed in it to the South Pole. St Paul's Cathedral, a masterpiece designed by Christopher Wren that dominates London. The Towers of London is one of the most popular tourist attractions, a medieval fortress with armories and historical relics. It's a museum now, isn't it? Yes, 900 years of history are behind its gates. The beef eaters who guard the tower still wear Tudor uniforms. The tower bridge is a tall structure. Its two halves can go up and down and allow seagoing ships to enter the Pool of London. Sunday in England is something special. Shops are closed, no heavy traffic, no theatres, no professional football in marked contrast to the situation in most European countries. Nelson's Column, the lions and fountains in Trafalgar Square. Feeding the pigeons, you know, in Trafalgar Square is a favorite pastime of many Londoners. Trafalgar Square is also a traditional place for meetings and demonstrations. Then it doesn't look quite so peaceful, and these policemen also look different. Piccadilly Circus is known as the heart of London's West End. Did you go to the National Gallery and the Tate? Certainly. But what I want to show you is paintings by other artists. A street exhibition? Yes. Such artists working on the pavements can still be found in the central streets of London. Beautiful London parks are full of people on Sundays. According to statistics, there are seven square metres of green area for each Londoner, on average. The lungs of London. Yes, that's how they're called. And the parks are beautiful. They've been planned to look as natural as nature itself. Walking in the London parks, you have the feeling that you're far, far away in the country. By the way, it was a perfect place to observe how Londoners live, the way they relax. And now, I'm going to take you to the London Zoo. This film section, please. Hurry up. The London Zoo covers 36 acres and contains a collection of some 6,000 animals. The Zoological Society of London runs it, as well as a country zoo at Whipsnade. Young visitors always enjoy making friends with the animals. Meet Johnny Parrot and Bobby the Elephant. <laughs> uh, 
And now, let's go on to more serious problems. Sunday morning is the time for marketing. There are a few popular markets in London. Petticoat Lane in the East End of London is not only a market, but a kind of entertainment. So this is the famous Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. Where speakers can talk to the people about all sorts of things. Yes, politics, religion and all that. Don't you think it's hypocritical on the part of the authorities? They permit free speech at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, but they arrest those who demonstrate their disagreement with government policy. Everybody knows what's happening in Ulster today. Buckingham Palace, the Queen's official residence in London. Windsor Palace. Like the Tower of London, this imposing castle was built by William the Conqueror. It's used as the Queen's residence at weekends and in spring. It houses a large collection of paintings. The Queen is at the head of the state, but she is constitutional. What does it mean, the Queen is constitutional? Well, you see, Great Britain is a monarchy, but the Queen's powers are limited by Parliament. The Prime Minister is usually the leader of the party that has a majority in the House of Commons. The party which obtains the majority of seats in the House is called the Government, and the second main group, the Opposition. So in fact, they have a two-party system. The British Parliament consists of two houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The Commons Chamber. The Government Party is on the right of the Speaker's Chair, the Opposition on the left. The Speaker's Chair. The Peers Chamber. According to tradition, the Queen attends the opening ceremony and makes a speech. When Parliament is in session, the light on the clock tower is on. The city, in fact, is the oldest part of London. Here is the Stock Exchange, a witness to many financial storms and crises. The Bank of England. Whitehall, a street of government offices. Fleet Street, the centre of British journalism. Not only London papers are published here, but papers of all other parts of the country. Many new houses are being built today, but they don't solve the housing problem of the poor. The Royal Festival Hall. A multi-storied garage. The Post Office Tower, the highest building in Great Britain today. A new market. One of the shopping areas. The exotic fruit are imported from other countries. So when the dockers are out on strike, the Londoners are left without bananas and lemons. So many things on display, but can everyone afford to buy them? Ah, that's a good question. At Harrods, one can see a dress displayed in the shop window costing 
450 pounds. There's always a shop nearby, that personal touch of an old city.